Five Nights at Freddy's The Twisted Ones Chapter 12 The world thundered around Charlie, shaking her rhythmically back and forth, strange objects digging harder into her each time she was jostled. Charlie opened her eyes and remembered where she was, or rather what she was inside. The awful image of the malformed Freddy sucking her into its mouth like some kind of snake hit her, and she closed her eyes again, biting her lips together so that she wouldn't scream. The thuds were footsteps, she realized. The animatronics were on the move. Her head throbbed with each blow, making it hard to think straight. I must have been knocked unconscious when it threw me in here, she thought. The torso of the thing was connected to the head by a wide neck, which was almost level with her own though its head stretched up another foot above her. It was like looking at the inside of a mask, the hollow of a protruding snout, the blank spheres that were the backs of the eyes. When she carefully tilted her head up, she could even see the bolt that attached the black top hat. Charlie's legs were cramped and bent at odd angles, wedged between pieces of machinery. She must have been stuck this way for some time, but she had no way of knowing how long. Her arms were constrained, suspended away from her body into the arms of the suit. Her whole body was covered in small points of pain, bruises and cuts from tiny pieces of plastic and metal that dipped each time they banged against her. Charlie could feel blood trickling down her skin in half a dozen places. She itched to wipe it away, but had no idea how much she could struggle without triggering the springs. Her mind flashed to the first murder victim, the lacerations that covered his body almost decoratively. She thought of Dave's screams as he died, and the bloated corpse beneath the stage at Pirate's Cove. That can't be me. I can't die like that. Charlie had told Clay what she knew about the Springlock suits. The animatronic parts were either recoiled, making room for a person inside to use it as a costume or fully extended so the mascot would work as a robot. But that was what Charlie knew from Fred Bear's family diner. This creature was different. She was inside a cavity made for a human being, but the suit was moving with complete autonomy. Its insides were full of metal architecture and wires, all except for the space that Charlie occupied. The animatronic lurched unexpectedly to the side, and Charlie was smacked against the jagged wall again with greater force. She cried out this time, unable to help herself, but there was no break in Freddy's stride. Either the creature hadn't heard, or it didn't care. She clenched her teeth, trying to quell the pounding in her head. Where are we going? She craned her neck this way and that, looking through the holes in the animatronic's battered suit. There were only a few holes, small, and on either side of the thing's torso. All she could make out was the forest. Trees rushing by in the darkness as they hurried to their mysterious destination. Charlie sighed in frustration, tears welling up. Where are you? Am I getting closer to you? Sammy, is it you? She gave up looking for hints outside and stared straight ahead at the inside of the suit. Stay calm, Aunt Jen's voice said in her head. Always stay calm. It's the only way to keep her head clear. She stared up into the mask at the inside-out features of the twisted Freddy. Suddenly, the blank spheres rolled back and the eyes flipped in, staring straight down at her with an impassive plastic gaze. Charlie screamed and jerked back. Something behind her snapped, lashing a whip-like piece of metal into her side. She froze in terror. No, please no! Nothing else triggered, and after a moment she cautiously settled herself in place trying not to meet the shiny blue eyes above her. Her eyes, where the piece of metal had hit her, shocked with pain each time she breathed. She wondered, alarmed, if a rib had broken. Before she could be sure, the animatronic lurched to the side again, and Charlie fell with it, hitting her head so hard that the blow reverberated through her body. Her vision darkened, closing to a tunnel, and as she faded into unconsciousness again, all she could see were Freddy's watching eyes. John's lungs were beginning to burn, his legs turning rubbery as they ran on and on through the forest. 
They had been running, for what felt like hours, though he knew it couldn't be. That was just his exhaustion playing tricks on his mind. The trail had faded. When they entered the forest, the trees had been their guide. They followed ripped, ragged bark and broken branches, and even torn roots or massive, careless feet had stepped. But the signs had grown farther between, then stopped entirely. Now John ran on in the direction the creatures seemed to have been headed. Truthfully, he might have been lost. As he darted around trees, trekked up and down small hills, and stumbled on uneven ground, John began to lose his sense of direction entirely. Ahead of him, Jessica ran confidently onward. He followed, but for all he knew, they could be running in an endless circle. Behind him, Clay's steps were slowing, his breathing heavy. Jessica, a few paces ahead, doubled back, jogging in place as she waited for them to catch up. Come on, guys, we're almost there, she said energetically. Almost where? John asked, struggling to keep his tone even. I'm just trying to be encouraging, she said. I was on my high school cross-country team for three years. Well, I was always more of a heavy lifter, you know. John panted, suddenly defensive. Clay, come on, you can do it! Jessica called. John glanced back. Clay had stopped running, and was doubled over with his hands on his knees, taking gasping breaths. With relief, John slowed to a walk and turned back. Jessica let out a frustrating sound and followed him to Clay. Are you alright? John asked. The older man nodded, waving him back. Fine, he said. Go ahead, I'll catch up. There's nowhere to go ahead to, John said. We're running blind. When's the last time you saw tracks? A while back, Clay said. But they were heading this way, and it's all we have to go on. But it's nothing to go on! John's voice rose in frustration. There's no reason to think they went this way! We're losing them, Jessica said urgently. She was still running in place, her ponytail bouncing like a little nervous animal behind her. Clay shook his head. No, we've already lost them. Jessica stopped running, but she kept shifting from one foot to the other. So now what? Something rustled in the trees ahead of them. Jessica grabbed John's arm, then released it quickly, looking embarrassed. The sound came again, and John started toward it, raising a hand to signal the others to stay. He made his way cautiously through the trees, glancing back once and noting that Jessica and Clay were close behind, despite his attempt to keep them back. A few feet farther on, the trees broke into an open field. They had reached the far side of the woods. Jessica gasped, and a split second later, John saw it. Halfway across the clearing, a figure stood in the darkness. It was almost featureless and flat, scarcely distinct from the shadows. John squinted, trying to get hold of the image to assure himself he was really seeing it. Heavy, black electrical wires stretched above the field like a canopy. But besides the wires, the field was clear. Though it was dark, there was no way for them to sneak closer to the figure without being seen. So John straightened his shoulders and began to walk slowly and openly toward it. The field was untended, and tall grass brushed John's knees as he walked. Behind him, Jessica and Clay made rustling sounds with every step. The wind whipped the grass against their legs, blowing more ferociously with each step they took. Almost halfway across the field, John stopped, puzzled. The figure was still there, but it seemed as far away from them as when they started. He glanced back at Jessica. Is it moving? She whispered. He nodded and started walking again, not taking his eyes from the shadowy figure. John, it looks like... Freddy, I don't know what it is, John answered cautiously, but I think it wants us to follow. I can't breathe, Charlie coughed and gagged, coming suddenly awake. She lay at her back, dirt pouring down onto her. It filled her mouth, clogging her nose and covering her eyes. She spat, shaking her head and blinking rapidly. She tried to raise her hands, but couldn't move them. She remembered suddenly that they were trapped inside the arms of the suit and would be mutilated if he struggled to free them. Buried alive! I'm being buried alive! She opened her mouth to scream, and more dirt fell in, hitting the back of her throat and making her gag again. Charlie could feel her pulse in her throat, choking her from the inside as surely as the dirt from outside. Her heart was beating too fast, and she felt lightheaded. She took faster breaths, trying in vain to fill her lungs, but she only stirred up the dirt and inhaled it. 
She spat, gargling, at the back of her throat to catch it before she swallowed, and turned her head to the side, away from the soil that fell like rain. She took a shuddering breath that shook her chest, and then another. You're hyperventilating, she told herself sternly. You have to stop. You have to calm down. You need your head clear. The last thought came in Unjen's voice. She stared at the now familiar side of the suit and took deep breaths, ignoring the dirt settling in her ear and sliding down her neck, until her fluttering heart slowed and she could breathe almost normally again. Charlie closed her eyes. You have to get your arms free. She concentrated all her attention on her left arm. Her t-shirt let the skin of her arms bear against the suit, so she could feel everything that touched her. With her eyes still closed, Charlie began to draw a map. There's something at the shoulder joints on either side, and a space just below. Spikes in a line all the way down to my elbow on the outside. And the inside has... What is that? She rocked her arm slowly, gently, back and forth against the objects, trying to envision them. They're not spring locks. She froze, focusing again on the place where the arm joined the torso. Those are spring locks. Okay, I'll get to it. Hands. She flexed her fingers slightly. The sleeves were wide, and her hands, which reached roughly to the creature's elbows, were less constrained than anything else. She spat out dirt again, trying not to notice that it was still pouring in steadily, piling up all around her. Breathe. While you still can. She clenched her jaw, envisioning the sleeve that encased her arm, and slowly began to work her way out of it. She dipped down her shoulder, rotated forward, held her breath, and pulled her arm three inches out. Charlie let out a shuddering sigh. Her shoulder was free of the spring locks. That was the hardest part. The rest of my arm won't touch them if I'm careful. She kept going, avoiding the things she thought might snap or stab her. When she was halfway out, her elbow at the shoulder seam, she twisted her arm too quickly and heard a snap. She stared horrified at the suit's shoulder, but it wasn't the spring lock. Something smaller inside had triggered, and now she could feel the burn of a fresh cut. Okay, it's okay. She got back to work. Minutes later, her arm was freed. She flexed it back and forth in the small space, feeling a little like she had never had an arm before. Now the other one. She wiped her face with her hand, smearing away the dirt, closed her eyes, and began again with her right arm. The second sleeve took less time to get out of, but fatigue and the growing mounds of dirt around her made Charlie careless. Twice she triggered small mechanisms that bruised her painfully, but didn't break her skin. She yanked herself free too fast, bumping the spring locks and only barely snatching her hand away before they cracked open. The arm jumped and jolted as the robotic skeleton inside it unfolded with a noise like firecrackers. Charlie clutched her hand to her chest, cradling it against her pounding heart as she watched. That could have been... It wasn't. It wasn't me. Focus. Legs. Her legs weren't pinned in place as her arms had been. They'd simply been awkwardly positioned, wedged between metal rods that ran through the body of the mascot. Without the weight of her body resting on them, she was able to maneuver. Cautiously, Charlie lifted her right leg into the air, pulling it over the rod and into the center of the torso. Nothing triggered and she did the same with her left. Her limbs freed. Charlie looked down at the length of the animatronic, at the door to the chest cavity. The latch was on the outside, but these creatures were old. Their parts were rusted and weak. She reached out and put her hands against the metal, feeling for springs and other devices. She couldn't quite see from where her head was stuck, and she couldn't move down safely, unless... The dirt had piled up almost a foot on either side of her head, and it covered the lower half of her body. Charlie abandoned the door momentarily and began to slowly move the dirt. She lifted her head slightly and brushed at the mound with her hands, pushing soil into the space she left. She rocked her body back and forth, using her hands to sweep dirt under her, until she lay on it like a thin bed. It wouldn't protect her from the suit if she triggered it, but it would give her an extra cushion making it slightly harder for her to jostle something and be skewered alive. She glanced at the arm of the suit that had been triggered, now filled with metal spines and hard plastic parts. A shiver went down her back. Now she inched down until she could see the chest plates, 
placed her hands in the center and began to push upward with all her might. After a moment, they came apart, and a rush of dirt cascaded in. Charlie coughed and turned her head, but she kept pushing as the dirt rained down on her. She managed to get the plates a foot apart, then crouched beneath them and paused for a moment. How deep am I? She thought for the first time. If she'd been buried six feet down, she might be escaping only to suffocate in the home stretch. What else am I going to do? Charlie closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and held it. Then she pressed herself up to the doors and began to claw her way out of the grave. The dirt wasn't packed tightly, but it still took effect. She scratched and scraped at it with her bare hands, wishing for a tool as her fingernails split and bled. As she hacked at the dirt, her lungs began to burn and clench, trying to get her to breathe. She scrunched her face up as hard as she could and scratched harder. Are you out there? I'm coming, but help me, please. I have to get out of this. Please, I can't die here. Bear to light. Her hand broke the surface, and she drew back in shock. Air. She gasped gratefully until she no longer felt starved of oxygen. Then she closed her eyes and battered her fists at the tiny hole above her head, breaking the sides until it was large enough to wiggle through. Charlie stood up, her feet still planted in the chest cavity of the suit. There had been little more than a foot of dirt covering her. She braced her feet on the half-open doors and clambered out of the hole, hauling herself up. She collapsed beside it, shaking with exhaustion. You're not safe yet, she scolded herself. You have to get up. But she couldn't bring herself to move. She stared, horrified, at the hole she had escaped from. Her face wet with tears. Time passed, minutes or hours. She lost track completely. Finally, mustering her strength, Charlie pushed herself up to a sitting position, wiping her face. She couldn't tell where she was, but the air was cool and still. She was indoors, and somewhere in the distance was a sound of rushing water. With the adrenaline gone, her head ached again, throbbing along with her heartbeat. It wasn't just her head. Everything hurt. She was covered in bruises. Her clothing was stained with blood. And now that she wasn't suffocating, she was aware again of the stabbing sensation in her ribcage every time she inhaled. Charlie prodded her ribs, trying to feel if anything seemed out of place. The bruises were already brightly colored, especially where parts of the suit had struck her, but nothing was broken. Charlie stood up, the pain receding enough to at least move and get her bearings. As she looked around, her blood went cold. It was Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. It can't be. The wave of panic rose again. She glanced around wildly, backing up away from the hole in the ground. The tables. The carousel in the corner. The stage. The tablecloths are blue. The tablecloths at Freddy's weren't blue, she said. But her relief was quickly washed by confusion. Then what is this place? The dining room was larger than the one at Freddy's, though there were fewer tables. The floor was black and white tile, except for large patches where the tiles were missing, revealing plots of packed dirt. It was oddly incongruous with everything else, which looked finished and brand new, if dusty. As she turned to the opposite wall, she saw that she was being washed. Large plastic eyes stared back from the dark, glancing down at Charlie, seeming to identify her as an intruder. Fur and beaks and eyes stood poised like a small army halfway up the wall. For a long moment, she stood stock still, bracing herself. But the animatronics didn't move. Charlie took a small step to one side, then the other. The eyes did not track her. The creatures looked forward, unseeing at their fixed points. Some of the faces were animals, and some seemed to be painted like clowns. Others appeared disturbingly human. Charlie moved closer and saw what it was they were perched on. All along the wall, arcade games and carnival attractions were lined up, each with its guardian beast or a giant face mounted on top. Their mouths were wide open, as if they were laughing and cheering some invisible spectacle. As Charlie peered through the darkness, she saw that the animals were unnaturally posed, their bodies twisted in ways no animal should be able to twist. She scanned the wide-mouthed faces again and shivered. With their bodies so torturously bent, they looked like they were screaming in pain. Charlie took deep breaths. As she calmed herself, she realized that there was music playing through the speakers overhead. It was quiet, familiar, but she couldn't name it. She approached the nearest of the games. 
a massive, contorted bird-like creature with a wide, curved beak presided over a large cabinet with a fake pond. Rows of ducks sat still in paper water, waiting for rubber balls to knock them down. Charlie looked up again at the creature perched on top of the game. Its wings stretched wide, and its head was thrown upward in the midst of an elaborate dance. It cast a shadow in front of the game, right where the player would stand. Charlie turned, not stepping any closer. Besides the dark pond, there were three arcade consoles lined up next to one another, their screens dusty. Three large chimpanzees squatted atop them, the tips of their toes gripping the edges above the screen. Their arms were raised, frozen in motion, and their teeth were barred in mirth, rage, or fear. Charlie stared for a moment at the teeth. They were long and yellow. Something about the arcade games nagged at her. She looked up and down carefully, but nothing tripped her memory. None were turned on, and none of them were games she had ever seen before. She wiped the dust from the screen of the central console, revealing a glossy black screen. Her face distorted, and the curved glass showed only a little bruising and a few visible cuts. Charlie self-consciously smoothed her hair. Wait. At Freddy's Pizza, ghostly images had been burned into the arcade screens after years of play. She pressed a couple of buttons experimentally. They were stiff and shiny, untouched. That's why it feels so empty, she said to the chimp above her. No one's ever been here, have they? The great ape didn't respond. Charlie glanced around. There was a doorway to her left, the bluish glow of an unseen black light emanating from the room beyond. Charlie went toward the light, through the door, and into another room of games and attractions. Here, too, they were all guarded by mascots, some more identifiable than others. Charlie staggered for a moment and put her hand on her forehead. Strange, she whispered, regaining her balance. She looked back the way she'd come. It must be the light making me dizzy, she thought. Hello? Someone called faintly in the distance. Charlie whirled around as if someone had shouted in her ear. She held her breath waiting for it to come again. The voice had been high and scared, a child. The sudden impression of life in this place shook her, as if waking her from a dream. Hello, she called back. Hello, are you alright? I won't hurt you. She glanced around the room. The sound of rushing water was louder here, making it hard to judge how far away the voice had come from. She moved quickly through the room, ignoring the wide-eyed creatures and the strange and garish games. A simple scripted table in the corner caught her attention, and she went to it swiftly. Charlie crouched down, careful to keep her balance, and lifted the cloth. Eyes stared back at her, and she startled, then studied herself. It's okay, she whispered, flipping the cloth up over the table. The glimmer of the eyes faded with the rush of light. There was no one there after all. Charlie put her hands on her forehead, and pressed hard for a moment, trying to ward off the growing pain in her temples. She went through another door, now unsure which way she'd come from, and discovered the source of the running water. Springing from the center of the wall to her left was a waterfall. It cascaded down over a rock face protruding several feet out and joined with a riverbed below. The water rushed from a wide pipe only partly concealed by the rock. The stream below was maybe three feet wide. It crossed the room, splitting the floor in two, and disappeared into the open mouth of a cave. Charlie watched for a moment, mesmerized by the water. After a moment, she noticed a narrow gap in the rock face behind the waterfall, just big enough for a person to walk through. Hello? Charlie called again, but only half-heartedly. Here the white noise of the water was louder than anywhere else. She realized after a second that it was a recording, overpowering the sound of the actual water. She surveyed the rest of the room, except for the waterfall and the little river. It was empty. But she noticed the floor had a gray border. No, it's a path. It was narrower than a sidewalk, paved with square gray cobblestones. It ran alongside the curved wall, tracing the way to the waterfall, and led through a narrow passage under the fall itself. Charlie crouched down to touch the stones. They felt like hard plastic given a rough finish. The path was likely there for a time when the place would be filled with other attractions. She could probably just walk straight across the room. Probably. Charlie stepped onto the cobblestones carefully, expecting them to give away 
under her weight, but they held. The manufactured coarseness of the rock's surface was sharp. It hurt a little to walk on it. Charlie dutifully followed the walkway, keeping close to the wall. She had a vague sense that stepping off onto the open floor might be dangerous. When she reached the waterfall, she went to the gap and gingerly touched the rock surface. It was the same plastic as the cobblestones. Like the path, the cliff was hard plastic, solid, but because it looked like rocks, it felt insubstantial when she touched it. Charlie took her hands away and wiped them on her jeans. She stepped carefully sideways, scooting through the hole behind the waterfall. The cavern was only a few feet long, but she stopped for a moment at the center. She felt trapped in the darkness, though she could see light on either side. Trapped. Her chest tightened, and she screwed her eyes shut. Calm down. Focus on what's around you, she thought. Charlie took a long, steadying breath and listened. Standing behind the waterfall, the tape recording was muffled. She thought she could hear the water itself rushing over her head and spilling down in front of her, though she couldn't see it. There was something else as well, quiet but distinct. From above her, or maybe behind, Charlie could hear the cranking of gears. A machine was churning the water, keeping it flowing in a giant cycle, making the whole thing work. The sound of the machine at work calmed her. The rising panic subsided, and she opened her eyes. She took another sideways step, moving closer to the light, and stubbed her toe on something hard. A shock of pain jolted her. The object tipped over, making a sloshing sound as it fell. Grinding her teeth, she waited a moment for her toe to stop hurting, then maneuvered herself into a crouch. It was a fuel can for the waterfall, she realized, as the machinery ground on overhead. There were several more, all neatly arranged along the wall, but this one had been in the middle of the path. If she had been going faster, she would have fallen over it. Charlie set it firmly beside the others, and stepped quickly into the other half of the room. Hello? The voice again, this time a little louder. Charlie stood up straight, immediately on alert. It had come from ahead. She didn't respond this time, but moved carefully toward it, staying on the path and keeping close to the wall. The hallway opened out into another room. The lights were dimmer here. In the corner opposite Charlie was a small carousel, but there seemed to be little else. Charlie scanned the room, and then her breath caught. The child was there, motionless, almost hidden in the shadows in the far corner of the room. Charlie approached slowly, apprehensive of what she might find. She blinked and shook her head hard, her dizziness resurging. The room seemed to spin around her. Who are you? Are you alright? She wanted to ask, but kept silent. She stepped closer, and the figure came into focus. It was just another animatronic, or perhaps just a normal doll, made to look like a little boy selling balloons. He was perhaps four feet tall, with a round head and a round body, his arms almost as long as his stout legs. He wore a red and blue striped shirt and a matching propeller beanie on his head. He was made of plastic, but his shiny face had something old-fashioned about it. Its features mimicked fairy tale dolls carved from wood. His nose was a triangle, and his cheeks were made rosy with two raised circles of dusty pink. His blue eyes were enormous, wide, and staring, and his mouth was open in a grin that bared all his even white teeth. His hands were fingerless balls, each gripping an object. In one, he held a red and yellow balloon, nearly half his size on a stick. In the other, he raised a wooden sign reading, Balloons! He was nothing like the creatures Charlie's father had made. Nothing even like the animatronics that had kidnapped her. They were horrible, but she recognized them as twisted copies of her father's work. This boy was something new. She circled around him, tempted to poke and prod. But she held back. Don't trans triggering anything. You're not so bad. Charlie murmured, cautious not to take her eyes off him. He just kept grinning, wide-eyed, into the darkness. Turning her attention to the rest of the room, Charlie looked thoughtfully at the carousel, the only thing there besides the boy. She was too far away to make out the animals. Hello, said the voice, right behind her. She spun back, just in time, to see the boy turn toward her with a single swinging step. Charlie screamed and ran back the way she came from, but beneath her feet, the dirt began to stir. It jolted, as if something were bumping upward. She scrambled backward as the dirt rose again, and something broke through the surface. Charlie ran for the carousel, the only cover in the room.
She ducked behind it, lying down on her stomach, so her body would be hidden behind its base. She stared down at the ground and listened to muffled scratches and beating sounds as some creature climbed free of its grave. The spinning sensation took hold of her again. The black and white tiles swam beneath her. She tried to push herself up to peek over the carousel, but her head felt leaden. The weight of it held her down, threatening to pin her back to the ground. There's something wrong with this room. Charlie gritted her teeth and yanked her head up. She scrambled to her feet, steadying herself against the carousel, and ran back the way she came, not looking back. The room with the games and the harsh black light was dizzying as well, and it sprawled out in all directions. Everything seemed farther apart than before. The walls miles away. Her mind was numb. She fumbled to remember where she was, unable to tell which way was which. She stumbled forward, and another mound of earth rose ahead of her. Something glimmered. Her eyes lit on the silhouettes of arcade machines, their reflective surfaces acting as beacons in the dark. She staggered toward them, her head swaying, so heavy she could hardly stay upright. The walls were crawling with activity. Small things skittered disjointedly all over the ceiling, but she couldn't see what they were. They were wriggling under the paint. The surface undulated chaotically. There was a strange ringing in the air, and though she only now registered it, she realized it had been sounding all along. She stopped in her tracks and looked desperately for the source, but her vision was clouding, and her thoughts were slow. She could barely name the things she saw. Rectangle? She thought fuzzily. Circle? No. Sphere? She looked from one indistinct shape to another, trying to remember what they were called. The effort distracted her from staying on her feet, and she fell to the ground again with a hard thud. Charlie was sitting upright, but her head dragged at her, threatening to pull her over. Hello? A voice called again. She put her hands on her head, forcing it back, and looked up to see several children standing around her, all with plump little bodies and broad smiling faces. Sammy? She moved toward them indistinctly. They were blurred and she couldn't see their features. She blinked, but her vision didn't clear. Don't trust your senses. Something is wrong. Stay back! Charlie screamed at them. She forced herself unsteadily to her feet and stumbled toward the shadows cast by the arcade towers. There, at least, she might be hidden from whatever worse things lurked in the room. The children went with her, rushing in trails of color around her and sweeping in and out of view. They seemed more to float than walk. Charlie kept her eyes on the towers. The children were distracting, but she knew there was something worse nearby. She could hear the sickening grind of metal and plastic twisting and a rasping noise she recognized. Sharp feet scraped against the floor, digging grooves into the tile. She crouched low, fixing her eyes on the nearest open door, and was struck with a certainty that this was the way she had come. She crawled desperately toward it, moving as fast as she could without fully standing. Finally, she collapsed under her own weight and lay flat on the tile again. You have to get up now! Charlie let out a scream and clambered to her feet. She ran headlong into the next room, barely keeping her balance and skidded to a stop. The room was full of dining tables and carnival games. It was where she'd started, but something had changed. All the eyes were tracking her. The creatures were moving, their skin stretching organically, their mouths snapping. Charlie ran for the dining table in the center of the room, the largest one with a tablecloth that almost reached the floor on all sides. She slid to the ground and crawled under it, curling herself into a ball and pulling her legs tight against her. For a moment, there was only silence, and then the voices began again. Hello? A voice called from somewhere nearby. The tablecloth rustled. Charlie held her breath. She looked at the thin gap between the tablecloth and the floor, but she could only see a sliver of the black and white tile. Something shot by, too fast to see, and she gasped and drew back, forgetting to be silent. The cloth rustled again, swinging gently inward. Someone outside was prodding it. Charlie maneuvered herself onto her hands and knees, feeling as if she had too many arms and legs. The cloth moved again, and this time a swirl of color appeared and vanished in the gap. The children. They had found her. The tablecloth swung again, but now it was moving on all sides, jouncing up and down as the children brushed against it. The strange colorful trails of movement appeared and vanished 
all around the edges of her hiding place, surrounding her like a wall of living paper dolls. Hello? 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 More than one spoke at a time now, but not in a chorus. Their voices overlapped until the word became a meaningless layer of sound, blurred like the floating children themselves. She turned her face to the side. One of the children stared back. It was under the cloth and gazing at her with a fixed grin and motionless eyes. Charlie jumped up, banging her head on the tablecloth. She looked around wildly. She was surrounded. A smiling, blurry face was staring at her from every side. One, two, three, four, four, four. She turned in an awkward circle on her hands and knees. Two of the children fainted at her, making little jumps, as if they were about to spring. She turned again, and the next one leapt at her, swimming under the cloth in a bright streak of blue and yellow. Charlie froze. What do I do? She scrabbled at her sluggish brain, trying desperately to revive it. Another sweep of color whooshed at her, all purple, and her brain awoke. Run! Charlie scrambled to the tablecloth on her hands and knees, and grabbed it, yanking it off the table as she stood. She threw it down behind her and ran, not looking back as someone called again. Hello? She raced toward a sign propped up in the middle of the room, knocking it over behind her as she ran past. Then a shadow near the stage caught her attention, and she swerved. She tripped over a chair and just barely managed to catch herself on another table. Her head was still too heavy. It jerked her forward, and she shoved the table aside, managing to stay upright. She arrived at the stage. And in the shadow, there was a door. Charlie fumbled with the knob, but it was spongy, too soft to turn. She grabbed it with both hands, pushing the whole force of her body behind it, and it moved at last. The door opened. She hurried through and slammed it shut behind her, feeling for some kind of latch. She found one and snapped it shut, and as she did, her hand brushed a light switch. A bulb flickered for a moment, then came on dimly, a single glowing strand of orange illuminating the room. Charlie started it for a minute, waiting for the rest of the light. No more appeared. She leaned back against the cabinet beside the door and slid down to sit, pushing her hands on her temples and trying to shove her head back to her normal size. The relative darkness steadied her. She stared down at the floor, hoping whatever was happening to her was almost over. She looked up and the room shifted nauseatingly. It's not over. Charlie closed her eyes, took a deep breath of the stale air and opened them again. Fur, claws, eyes. She clapped a hand over her mouth and stopped herself from screaming. A jolt of adrenaline cut briefly through the fuzziness. The room was full of creatures, but she couldn't make sense of them. The dark fur of a simian arm lay on the floor, inches from her feet, but out of it spilled coils and bare wire. The rest of the ape was nowhere to be seen. There was something large and gray right in front of her, a torso with arms and webbed, amphibious hands. But there was no head. Instead, someone had balanced a large cardboard box where the neck would have been. Past the torso were sending figures, a phalanx of shadows. As she stared at them, they resolved into something comprehensible. They were unfinished mascots, as distorted as the ones outside. A rabbit stood at the back. Its head was brown, like a jackrabbit, and its ears were swept back but its eyes were just empty holes. The rabbit's body was hunched to the side, and its arms were short, held up as if in surrender. Two metal frames stood in front of it. One was headless, and the other topped with the head of a red-eyed, slavering black dog, whose fangs stuck out from its mouth. Charlie kept her eyes on it for a moment, but it didn't move. Beside it, Charlie cringed and ducked her head, covering her face with her arms. Nothing happened. Cautiously, she lowered her hands and looked again. It was Freddy, the misshapen Freddy that had been buried. Charlie glanced at the door, then back at Freddy. He stared straight ahead, his eyes blank and his hat askew. It can't be him, she told herself. It's just another costume. But she shrank back, trying to make herself smaller. Something delicately stroked the top of her head. Charlie screamed and yanked herself away. She turned to see a disembodied human arm on the shelf above where she'd been sitting. Its hand stuck out at just the right height to brush her head. Other arms were stacked beside it and on top of it, some covered in fur and others not. Some had fingers, some simply ended, cut off at what would have been the wrist. 
The other shelves were stacked with similar things. One with pelts of fur, another with piles of detached feet. One just had dozens of extension cords tangled up in an ugly nest. From outside the door, Charlie heard the voice again. Hello? The doorknob rattled. She squeezed past the mutilated arcade games and chopped off parts, gritting her teeth as she crawled over soft things that squelched beneath her weight. As she stepped back, her shoulder crashed into one of the standing metal frames, the headless one. It rocked on its ungrounded feet, threatening to topple. She tried to pull away, but the frame followed, swaying for a moment as she fought to free her hands. She yanked them back and ducked as more metal frames came crashing to the ground. She squatted down beside one of the large arcade cabinets. The plastic casing was cracked so badly the words and pictures were entirely obscured. Right beside her, inches away, were Freddy's stocky legs. Charlie huddled down, pressing against the game as if she could blend in with it. Don't turn around, she thought, eyeing the motionless bear. The dim light seemed to be moving like a spotlight. It glinted off the dog's red eyes, then the gleaming tusk, then off something sharp cornered at the back of the rabbit's hollow socket. Just out of her line of sight, something moved. Charlie whipped her head around, but there was nothing there. From the corner of her eye, she saw the rabbit straighten its spine. She turned frantically back toward it, but found it hunched in its same agonized posture as before. Slowly, Charlie looked around her in a half circle, keeping her back pressed against the console. Hello? The doorknob rattled again. She closed her eyes and pressed her fist to her temple. No one's here. No one's here. Something rustled in front of her, and Charlie's eyes snapped open. Scarcely breathing, she watched as Freddy came alive. A sickly twisting sound filled the room, and Freddy's torso began to turn. Hello? Her eyes shifted to the door for a split second, and when she looked back again, Freddy was still. I have to get out of here. She took a moment to measure the path, looking first to the door, then to Freddy in front of her, mapping a blurry route. At last she went, looking down at her hands and nothing else, as she crawled steadily around the motionless legs of the standing animatronics, and passed the half-bestial games. Don't look up. Something brushed against her leg as she passed it, and she pressed on, her head down. Then something grabbed her ankle. Charlie screamed and flailed, trying to kick herself free, but the iron grip tightened. She looked frantically over her shoulder. Freddy was crouched behind her, the light glinting off his face and making him seem to smile. Charlie yanked her foot back with all her strength, and Freddy pulled even harder, dragging her closer. Charlie grabbed the leg of a pinball game and poised herself up to her knees. As Freddy tried again to drag her back, the game shook and rattled like it was about to fall. Clutching at it with all her might, Charlie jerked her body up and forward. Freddy's claws tore her skin as she wrenched herself free, and the pinball machine collapsed under her weight. Freddy lurched forward, that horrible mouth unhinged again like an enormous snake. He crouched again, coming toward her in a sinuous motion. She scrambled over the broken game toward the door. Behind her, something rustled and scraped, but she didn't look back. Her hand on the doorknob, Charlie stopped as the room around her swayed. The noise behind her grew louder, closer, and she turned to see Freddy crawling toward her in a predatory crouch. His mouth was wide. Dirt poured out of it in a steady stream. Hello, Charlie? Came a voice from outside. But this voice was different. It wasn't the animatronic child. Charlie fumbled at the knob, the spinning sensation in her head worsening as Freddy came slowly, purposefully closer. The room swayed again, and her hand closed on the knob and turned it. She shut the door open and stumbled into the light. Charlie! Someone cried, but she didn't look up. The sudden brightness was piercing, and she held up a hand to shield her eyes as she forced the door shut again. The ringing hadn't stopped while she was in the closet, but now it was louder. It filled her ears like a skewer, plunging into her swollen brain. She fell to her knees, wrapping her arms around her head, trying to protect it. Charlie, are you okay? Something touched her, and she shied away. Her eyes screwed shut against the light. Charlie, it's John, the voice said, cutting through the awful noise and something in her went still. John? She whispered, her voice raspy. The dust from the grave had settled in her throat. Yeah. She turned her head and peered up through the shield of her eyes. Slowly, the blazing light calmed, and she saw a human face. 
John, are you real? She asked, uncertain what kind of answer would convince her. He touched her again, a hand on her arm, and she didn't pull away. She blinked, and her vision cleared a little. She looked up, feeling as if she were opening herself to attack. Her eyes lit on two more people, and her halting mind slowly named them. Jessica? Clay? Yeah, John said. She put her hand on his and tried to focus. She could see Jessica, who was doubled over, her hands over her own ears. The noise, Charlie said. She hears the noise too, do you? It grew louder, drowning out John's response, and Charlie grabbed his hand. Real. This is real. The children! She cried out suddenly, as a swath of undulating colors rose from underneath the tables. They flew, their feet not touching the ground, their bodies leaving comet-like trails of color behind them. You see? Charlie whispered to John. Jessica! He shouted. Look out! Jessica straightened, dropping her hands, and yelled something indistinct. The children converged on her in a swarm, dancing around her, darting in close, then back out again, as if it were a game, or an ambush. Two rushed on Clay, who stared them down until they shriveled and swirled back to join the circle around Jessica. The lights! Jessica cried, her voice rising above the painful ringing noise. Clay, it's coming from the lights on the walls! She pointed up, where Charlie could just make out a long row of decorative colored lights, evenly spaced. A gunshot cut through with the clamor, and Charlie gripped John's hand tighter. Jessica's hands were on her ears again. The children were still in motion, but it was a nervous, shimmering movement. They stopped in place. Clay stood with his back to them all, his gun pointed at the wall. Charlie watched, wide-eyed, as he took aim again and shot out the bulb of the second light fixture. The room dimmed lightly, and he moved on to the third, then the next, then the next, then the next. As one shot rang out after another, Charlie's head began to equalize, like whatever stuff had filtered to the point of bursting was slowly being drained. The room darkened, one bulb at a time. Bang! She looked up at John, and his face was clear. It's really you, she said, her voice still choked with dust. Bang! It's really me. He agreed. Bang! The children's shimmering slowed, giving glimpses of arms and legs and faces. Jessica took her hands from her ears. Bang! Clay shot the last light, and the children stopped shimmering. They wavered briefly, on the edge of solidity. A sickening ripple of lights in a scattered harmony, and then they were still. The room was silent. It was still lit by the overhead lights, but all the others were dead. Jessica looked around her, bafflement and horror taking turns on her face. The children were no longer children. They were wind-up toys, plastic boys, and striped shirts, wearing plastic smiles and propeller beanies, and offering balloons. Jessica, come here, Clay said in a low voice, holding out his hand. She stepped toward him, glancing warily at the balloon boys as she moved between them. He took her hand to help her through, as if he were pulling her out of a chasm. Charlie slowly let go of John's hand and put hers to her temples, checking to make sure everything was still there. Her head no longer ached. Her vision was clear. Whatever had come over her was gone. Charlie, Jessica said, are you all right? What's going on in here? I feel drugged. These things aren't real. Charlie steadied herself and slowly got to her feet. I mean, they're real, but not how we're seeing them. This whole place is an illusion. It's twisted somehow. Those things. She gestured toward the wall where Clay had shut out the lights. Those things are like the disc we found. They emit some kind of signal that distorts how we see. Charlie shook her head. We have to get out of here, she said. There's something worse here than these. She pushed over a balloon boy, and it toppled easily. Its head popped off as it hit the ground, and it rolled across the floor. Hello? It muttered, much quieter than before. And that is the end of chapter 12. Thank you for listening to this chapter of Five Nights at Freddy's, The Twisted Ones. I really hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you did enjoy it, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new to this channel, subscribe and click that bell icon so you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video and to know when the next chapter of this novel will be going up. And I'll be back next week with the next chapter. All right, see ya.